this hearing to order. The Subcommittee on House, Service, on House Armed Services Readiness Subcommittee. As I review this subcommittee's work over the last several years in preparation for this hearing, one central theme jumped out at me. The military departments have struggled in every area to achieve the right balance between investments in new uh, platforms and construction or procurement of those new platforms and sustainment of its existing inventory. While procurement of systems is within the jurisdiction of other House Armed Service subcommittees, once the aircraft, ships, ground vehicles, and every other thing has been purchased, the readiness subcommittee is responsible for overseeing the decades of maintenance and training so that the service members are ready for combat. The accounts which sustain and maintain these systems are chronically underfunded, and the infrastructure that facilitates that sustainment, our shipyards, our depots, our bases, are often crumbling or woefully out of date. This focus on readiness <clears throat> has taken new importance given world events. Russia's immoral invasion of Ukraine has illustrated to the world anew that military success is built on a foundation of sound sustainment and logistics in a contested environment. This failure to balance the appetite for new with the requirement to sustain what the department already has applies as much to barracks as it does to ships and tanks. We have been repeatedly told by witnesses at hearings that military personnel are the department's number one asset. However, when, they are, when there are hard choices to be made, the sustainment of barracks, dorms, and child development centers, the places where children must go when the men and women are called to duty, are often first on the chopping block. Unfortunately, we here in Congress, all the members of this committee and others, share some of the blame for this ongoing phenomena. To steal a quote from one of our witnesses today, General Martin, O&M funds do not have a zip code and therefore are not particularly relevant to what's home to all of us. As a result, the o and funds are too often an attractive target to offset all manner of other priorities. In addition, it can be difficult to understand the true impact of the cuts in these accounts on service members and on readiness. I look forward today to this hearing, hearing from our witnesses on a number of topics, not only about updates on the many topics within the subcommittee's purview, but also on the real-world impacts of not fully funding operation and maintenance accounts. We have a lot to cover, so I will put my further thoughts and remarks aside and turn to Ranking Member Waltz of Florida for his remarks. Hey, thank you, Chairman Garamendi. And I, too, want to especially thank all of you. Thank, uh, thank our witnesses. I appreciate that this hearing's a little bit out of sequence. Um, but uh, I, I do appreciate your, your patience and willingness to be here. And obviously, typically during this hearing, we would be pouring over the budget uh, to inform your work on this year's, uh, to form our work on this year's NDAA. Obviously, you know, as you know, we've completed that business last week, uh, at least in the House. Nonetheless, I do believe that today's readiness update uh, is important. Uh, it's vitally important. Uh, it, we need it to, content, to inform our continued oversight. Um, and the wonderful thing uh, about the NDAA is once we've completed our business, we're already starting on, on the next one. Um, and you know, it does provide an opportunity for you all to start informing uh, that work. And particularly, I think we have so much experience uh, right now in, in our vice chiefs, uh, and we look forward to absorbing that. That said, uh, I, for one, am frustrated, uh, as I think you just heard from the chairman, uh, since uh, coming to this position at the number of cuts uh, from O&M that we continue to see uh, from all sides. Um, at, the, at the end of the day, we're seeing these cuts to pay for lines and programs that do have a zip code. Uh, and, and in my view, that's unacceptable. Uh, even as Congress adopted a $35 billion top line increase uh, to address in part record high inflation, we simultaneously tied your hands behind your backs. Uh, and, and this comes at a time when the threat landscape couldn't be more complex from what we're seeing 
uh, with the CCP's uh, uh, rapid military buildup. Uh, I'm firmly convinced and, and just had a trip out to the Indo-PACOM uh, region that if we continue to tread water within the next decade, uh, the CCP will modernize its military, bring it to parity, uh, and in some areas overmatch uh, with our own. Uh, and when I talk to the Indo-PACOM commander, a key part of his strategy to deal with that is to have forces forward. That's a lot of O&M. Uh, and so I, I look forward to talking to you about that uh, issue. Obviously, as we're seeing in Russia uh, and Ukraine, it it's a reminder that we have to sustain high levels of readiness. Uh, and, and I know we'll have many conversations today and going forward about how to strike that balance between readiness and modernization. Um, Back to the Indo-Pacific, I do look forward to hearing about the progress the Army and the Marine Corps is making uh, on the littoral regiments and the multi-domain task forces in the region. Uh, over the past two years, this committee has paid particularly close attention to contested logistics. Again, as we're seeing in Ukraine, logistics wins or loses wars. Uh, and I remain concerned that the department's own plans uh, for watercraft and logistics support vessels in the Pacific, uh, as well as bulk fuel laydowns are lacking. Neither appear close to ready to support to and sustain inter and intra theater operations. Uh, another focus of the subcommittee has been on the industrial base. Uh, we've heard it and we'll continue to focus on it. The, the depots are, are frankly ancient. Uh, the recapitalization plans will continue to require significant investment. Uh, on the Navy side, when I spoke with Admiral Lesher, uh, he and I spoke several months ago, he said that readiness was a second priority only for the Navy, only behind the Columbia-class submarine. Yet when we looked at the Navy's UPL list uh, earlier this year, we found five of the top ten unfunded priorities to be readiness-related. Uh, and among those key readiness degraders were spares, uh, repair parts, and organizational and depot level maintenance. So I know we all need to make those difficult trade-offs. I know we don't have an unlimited uh, budget environment, but I do believe as long as uh, I'm honored to sit on in this position on this committee, that it's time for all of us, the services and Congress, to put our money where our mouth is. We have to do better uh, on these readiness accounts. Uh, and, and again, that is across the board. Um, uh, I, I, again, I thank the witnesses. I'll yield, Mr. Chairman. Look forward to this hearing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walsh. Uh, you are echoing or leading the same set of questions that are on my mind. Uh, before we uh, formally introduce our witnesses, I do want to recognize General Martin, who is retiring soon. And I, after 40 years of service to this country, extraordinary record, I do understand that uh, you cut short a very important task back in Texas, something about uh, moving into a, a new home and uh, duties of, of family, responsibilities. So thank you very much for being here. We recognize your service, and we very much appreciate your dedication to, uh, to duty and uh, to uh, this committee. Uh, and I will send a formal, I'm so sorry to your wife. <laughs> I understand these things very, very clearly. Um, so with that, um, Mr. Walsh, would you like to add? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Martin, thank you for your service uh, all these decades. But more importantly, thank you to your family. It's a team effort. And they're the ones that bear the sacrifices. Uh, whether it's deployments to overseas or deployments to Washington, D.C. I'm not sure which is worse. But, uh, yeah, I, you know, I was, I was reviewing your bio, and uh, uh, I, too, started out as an armor officer, so you made a great decision there uh, to have a career as a tanker. A little disappointed you're not retiring in, in Florida. Everybody makes mistakes. But uh, well earned, sir, and, uh, and thank you. Well, I think I said earlier that all politics are local. Something about zip codes. <laughs> uh, thank you so very much. Our witnesses today are uh, extraordinary uh, members of the armed forces who have a lifetime, well, almost 40 years for all of you of service. I uh, really appreciate all of that. 
Uh, General Martin, we've talked already uh, about your 40 years. Uh, Vice Admiral Critis, also uh, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations, uh, Capabilities and Resources of the United States Navy. Uh, General uh, Smith, Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps. Uh, General David uh, Alvin, Vice Chief of Staff uh, for the United States Air Force. And uh, Lieutenant General David Thompson, Vice Chief of Sta Space Operations. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so very much. I was running through your resumes uh, and bios earlier uh, yesterday and again this morning. And all of you entered service at about within two years of each other in the uh, mid-80s. Uh, we thank you for that. Uh, we thank you for the educational institutions that uh, prepared you for this uh, service to our nations. Uh, so with that, uh, let's start with um, uh, General Martin, if you would like to make your statement. Chairman and Ranking Member Waltz, thank you. And uh, here's the good news. Uh, my wife's my number one fan, and I can almost guarantee you she's listening to this if it's streaming right now. So she th that those thanks and that apology will be well received. And uh, thank you very much, but it's an honor to be here. Distinguished members of the subcommittee, thanks for this opportunity to discuss the readiness posture of the United States Army with you today. War in Ukraine rages on. The resolve of the Ukrainian people is humbling. They face threats that permeate all domains. It reminds me of the complexity of today's challenges, but also that nations, not just armies, go to war. There's much to be learned from our actions in Ukraine. First, the Army's ability to respond rapidly with military options to the Russia invasion of Ukraine is a full expression of our high state of readiness. This is a direct reflection of Congress's steadfast support. The success of the European Defense Initiative is undeniable. It enabled us to deploy over 12,000 additional soldiers to NATO's eastern flank within hours and days of Russia's invasion. We're also seeing the value of the United States Armor building partner capacity through the State Partnership Program, foreign military sales, and years of training Ukrainian forces through the Joint Multinational Training Group, Ukraine. These successes are a model for what the United States Army can also provide for the Indo-Pacific, where land forces are still the center of gravity of the nation's militaries in that region. Not only is your Army ready to fight tonight to support allies and partners in that theater, but we're uniquely capable of building partner capacity there as well. The war in Ukraine confirms that the character of war is changing, but the nature of war has remained constant. Nations, not just armies, go to war, and we must acknowledge that winning is a result of ready forces, but also a ready society and a ready defense industry. Your army recognizes the challenges on the horizon, particularly with accessions, retention, and realizing our modernization objectives. Thanks to your support, oversight, and direction, we've been working tirelessly to address these. Our people are critical to our readiness, but recruiting motivated, fit, and academically proficient men and women continues to be a challenge. Only 23% of military-aged men and women in the United States are qualified to serve, and that does not even reflect propensity. We are pursuing every approach to recruit talent, including modifying our marketing strategy, providing bonuses, and considering soldier location preferences through our options programs. We're also working to address fitness and training needs within the recruiting pool. For instance, we've introduced a new program in basic training which acclimates recruits to a higher level of physical activity to reduce injuries while in basic training and beyond in their careers. The Army is also taking proactive measures to improve soldiers' working and living environments in order to prevent or reduce harmful behaviors. And we are working to improve the quality of life on our installations in order to retain soldiers, family members, and civilians. Finally, we're continuing to modernize our organic industrial base in order to ensure that we've effectively built the force of tomorrow. We're employing innovative new technologies like 3D printing to mitigate supply chain issues. We're also continuing along a 15-year phased approach 
facilitated by systems like Vulcan that can help us make informed investment decisions as we go along. At the same time, we're an all-volunteer force and a reflection of the society we serve. We are grateful for Congress' continued efforts to improve the whole of society mental and physical health, attract and retain talent, and improve the resiliency of our American de defense industrial base. We are a ready and trained Army, but our readiness imperative to our mission is also fragile. Our Army must be both responsive to the threats today while still modernizing to be ready for the threats for tomorrow. We will continue to collaborate, collaborate with academia, external agencies, sister services, and Congress to fulfill our mandate to be the most lethal ground force in the world. Thank you for your continued support, and I look forward to your questions. General Martin, thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, and the written testimony also it covers many other subjects in, in greater detail. Uh, Vice Admiral Critis, if you would uh, come forward with your testimony. Ranking Member Garamundi, correction, Chairman Garamundi, Ranking Member Waltz, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the readiness posture of your Navy. Today, the Department is delivering an adaptable, ready, and lethal Navy to the joint force at the front lines of strategic competition. Foundational to the combat credible power is strong execution and resourcing of the Navy's force generation process. Readiness remains the critical enabler to naval superiority, and while we've made progress in reducing maintenance delays, delivering high-end training, and improving manning in our ships and squadrons, we still have work to do. Personnel readiness is core to naval power, and we owe our sailors, our civilians, and their families a work environment and a community and a support structure where they are rewarded for their talent and treated fairly and valued for their sacrifices. Our budget funds construction and repair of child development centers. It increases child care fee assistance. It adds significant funding to unaccompanied housing sustainment as well as increased housing capacity overseas, ensuring that our sailors have access to adequate mental health care as a top priority as we focus on building sufficient health care capacity and better foster a culture where it's okay to ask for help. We are comprehensively implementing both medical and non-medical uh, mental health assistance aimed at improving mental health care, optimizing performance, pr promoting signature behaviors, as well as uh, suicide prevention. We are increasing both virtual mental health access and the number of active duty mental health care providers assigned to our operational and training commands, and this is allowing uh, more flexibility in connecting our sailors with providers. As the national demand for mental health uh, care workers increases, we are pursuing innovative ways to recruit and retain the expertise needed to support the fleet. Shifting from personnel readiness to fleet readiness, we remain focused on ship and submarine and aviation maintenance improvements. We have reduced delays in our public and private shipyards, and we continue to improve using analytically driven insights. Additionally, we have prioritized investments in the shipyard infrastructure optimization program to bring our aging public yards back to needed standards necessary for the future fleet of our, and our Navy. Aviation readiness remains strong. We are maintaining 80% or better mission capable rates for our tactical aircraft, and we're showing improving trends in our other type model series. Expansion of the Fallon Range Training Complex is a top legislative priority. It's a critical enabler to support the joint force and improve combat readiness by allowing us to train how we will fight. Future readiness remains a focus as we balance requirements for recapitalization and modernization across the Navy portfolio. This is required to deliver the most capable Navy now and in the future within the allotted top line and hard choices are required, and we look forward to working with Congress to ensure that the Navy is properly resourced. Finally, the United States Navy, or I'm sorry, the United States requires a lethal, capable, and ready Navy to defend the homeland and provide an enduring maritime advantage. I look forward to working with the committee to ensure that the Navy is delivering the readiness required to answer the Navy's nation's call. Thank you. Admiral, thank you very much. We now turn to the Marine Corps. General Smith. Well, Thank you, Chairman Germendi, Ranking Member Waltz, and distinguished members of this committee. Uh, it's a privilege to get to appear before you today, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. The Marine Corps remains your nation's crisis response force, the 911 force. We are ready 
to deter and defeat those adversaries that would challenge us. We provide a, con a contribution to the naval and joint force that is very unique. Our identity as Marines centers on being ready to deter, fight, and win as individuals, as units, and as a corps. Everything we do is in support of warfighting advantage and being the most ready when our nation may be least ready. That's our obligation to the American people and to you. The Marine Corps is currently executing an extensive modernization campaign known as Force Design 2030 to best prepare us for the pacing threat posed by China. That Force Design 2030 ensures that the Marines who are operating forward, campaigning, can respond to crises, contribute to integrated deterrence, and conduct the day-to-day -day campaigns that are required with our allies and partners to deter and, if necessary, defeat an adversary. It makes us more ready today and will make us even more ready tomorrow. Change is very difficult. It's difficult culturally, fiscally, but it has to happen and happen now because the pace of our adversary is accelerating. We prioritize L-class shipping and the light amphibious warship, which are both vital to our ability to provide the combatant commander what is required to execute warfighting tasks. We prioritize our talent management, our people. How do we retain, we talk about recruiting, but how do we retain our way out of a difficult recruiting environment? And we also pr uh, prioritize our training and education modernization so that those Marines have the best tools available to make them the most ready. And every dollar lost, to your point, Mr. Chairman, on O&M, uh, means that uh, a Lance Corporal or a Lieutenant shoulders a greater share of the burden. And uh, we should not and cannot allow that. And I would simply close by saying that your support and oversight of our readiness efforts enhances and preserves our lethality as the nation's crisis response force. And we are very grateful for that oversight. Uh, I look forward to your questions, and I would uh, return the, the courtesy uh, as uh, Congresswoman Speer uh, closes out also nearly 40 years. Uh, Ma'am, thank you for, for making us better. Uh, we have a saying that uh, steel sharpens steel, so thank you for, uh, for always asking us tough questions. It does make us better, and uh, we salute you for that amount of service, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Having worked, oh, thank you very much, General. Uh, having worked for nearly 40 years with uh, Congressman Speer, uh, you're quite correct about the steel. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're going to go, uh, let me get back on track here. <laughs> uh, let's turn to the Air Force. Uh, General Alvin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's always a blessing and a curse to follow Eric Schmidt because I would like to share the same sentiments, but I can't say it any better than Eric did. So, ma'am, thank you so much for what you do for all of us and have done for all these many years. Chairman Garamendi and Ranking Member Waltz and distinguished committee members, on behalf of our Air Force Secretary and Chief of Staff, Thank you for the opportunity to join you today to discuss the critically important topic of readiness. Let me begin by expressing our appreciation for this body's continued partnership and support in delivering the resources necessary for the Air Force to pursue transformational change. The pace of China's accelerating modernization, coupled with Russia's acts of naked aggression, are palpable reminders that the threats to our national security are very real and perhaps closer than we'd previously believed. Against the backdrop of this strategic environment, your Air Force is committed to delivering air power anytime, anywhere. It's our promise to the nation, to our joint force, our allies and partners. However, the only way to make good on that promise is to ensure our readiness today is adequately balanced with our readiness tomorrow. Readiness starts with our airmen, both in and out of uniform, who constitute our greatest strength and our competitive advantage. We must continue to attract and retain the best that America has to offer if we are to successfully take on the challenges ahead. To that end, the proposed budget increases funding by $27 million to expand our outreach to underrepresented groups, untapped geographic regions, and academic sources. Additionally, we're committing significant resources to maintaining and improving dormitories, child development centers, and housing. We're also making progress on our aircrew deficit which remains a challenge. Continuing the positive trend from last year, we reduced our pilot shortage by 250 airmen, yet we still 
have over 1,600 pilot vacancies. To resolve this issue, we are using a combination of new training programs to generate the same or better quality pilots in less time. At the same time, we're leveraging numerous monetary and non-monetary initiatives to retain their valued experience. We're also modernizing our operational test and training infrastructure, which consists of both physical and synthetic environments to enable quality, threat-relevant training. We're upgrading our ranges to accommodate advanced fifth-generation platforms and capabilities. At the same time, we're investing in synthetic training tools that allow us to maintain readiness using robust, dependable, and cost-effective methods of virtually replicating high-end combat scenarios. To address our weapon system sustainment challenges, we are constantly pursuing improvements in reliability and maintainability through investment in emerging capabilities such as condition-based maintenance plus, advanced manufacturing, and robotics, amongst others. While the proposed budget increases weapon system sustainment funding by a billion dollars, this will likely only maintain our current level of resourcing of 85% of the requirement due to sustainment challenges of older aircraft as well as inflation. To ensure our Air Force is building and sustaining readiness against the pacing challenge and communicating that to the joint force, we are implementing Air Force's force generation or AFOR-GEN model. This model produces a predictable, repeatable cycle against which we can measure and build more comprehensive readiness, thus producing a force optimized to address the priorities in the national defense strategy. However, significant challenges remain. The increasing aggregate age of our platforms and systems is critically challenging our ability to provide adequate readiness today while transforming our Air Force to meet the increasingly complex and consequential threats ahead. The high cost to sustain and operate these systems, along with their decreased relevance, is making your Air Force less effective in accomplishing what the nation expects us to do. Additionally, we require stable funding and appropriations to effectively use the taxpayer dollars throughout the year to best build and sustain readiness. We have tough choices ahead, and we will continue to evaluate those choices in a manner that balances the readiness requirements of today with a mandate to provide a capable, relevant, and ready future Air Force. We know that all of this must be done within available resources, and we look forward to working with Congress as we chart this way ahead. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Chairman Garamendi, Ranking Member Waltz, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. On behalf of the Secretary of the Air Force and Chief of Space Operations, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. As we examine the readiness of the Space Force to accomplish its missions, the driving factor is a relatively recent and dramatic shift from space as a comparatively benign military domain to one that is contested. As this committee well knows, the capabilities and benefits provided from space are vital to our way of life and critical critical to effective military operations in all other domains. Over the past two decades, our nation's space sector has made dramatic technological advancements that have profound impact on all facets of human endeavor, and strategic competitors have taken notice. They've made a concerted effort to offset our civil, commercial, and military advantages in space. In short, the permissive environment that benefited the United States for decades has changed forever. Russia and China continue to pursue increases in capability and show a willingness to threaten U.S. allied and partner operations and assets in space. Their actions are not aimed at uh, preserving peace and stability. Rather, they are rapidly developing and fielding space capabilities with aggressive military intention. The readiness of the Space Force must be measured against our ability to respond to these challenges, not today's operations. As it relates to the requirements of routine day-to-day -day operations, Space Force, Space Force units are more than ready and able to accomplish their assigned missions. However, when measured against the ability to respond to an adversary in a contested domain, much work remains to be done. The training standards and equipment that served us well in the past are not sufficient to address the threats we expect to contend with now and in the future. To that end, the Space Force is actively redefining and redesigning our force readiness model and training standards to more effectively prepare Space Forces in support of the national defense and our assigned missions. Let me take a moment to describe some of those shifts. First, the key challenge for the Space Force crews that execute missions continuously in peacetime 
is finding extra time to conduct training that will be needed to conduct those missions in conflict. To address this, we've developed a new force generation model specifically tuned for employed in place forces executing 24-7, 365 day missions. This new model constructs force packages and introduces a rotational cycle that allows guardians not only to execute their day-to-day -day responsibilities, but also preserves time to conduct much needed advanced training and readiness activities. This model allows us to address the readiness requirements of each unique crew member, say a satellite operator, an intelligence spe specialist, or a cyber defender, providing them with dedicated time to improve their skills against the most challenging threats. It then brings them together as a, clue to, or as a crew to complete their readiness training and fully prepare before we commit them to operations for mission execution day to day. The second change in our ra training regiment is in the area of equipment. Today, Guardians train by and large on equipment designed for operations in that benign environment. The focus of this training is procedural proficiency for routine operations. There is much less thought given to the training of tactics necessary to counter hostile action. Our guardians need different training objectives and tools for this contested domain. To meet these needs, the Space Force is actively pursuing a full spectrum operational test and training infrastructure. This infrastructure will be a system of systems designed to provide live and virtual training opportunities. It will include high fidelity digital models and simulators to allow us to validate tactics, test system limitations, and create a synthetic training environment against the thinking adversary. The development and fielding of this infrastructure is one of the highest priorities of the Space Force. Without it, Guardians would not be able to have defendable systems, proven tactics, or the ability to practice their craft against an opposition force. The operational test and training infrastructure will be a force multiplier, allowing Guardians to maintain and improve our strategic advantage in space. Last but certainly not least, readiness and contested domain requires the Space Force to modernize our force structure. We must counter and defeat a thinking adversary who becomes more and more capable and dangerous every day. We must transition away from legacy systems to new force designs that complicate the adversary's decision calcu calculus and likelihood of success. First and foremost, to deter conflict in space, but ultimately to win should an adversary choose to attack. The present fiscal year 2023 budget makes investments in exactly those areas. In conclusion, the Space Force will continue to prioritize readiness in all of its facets to effectively deter adversaries and, if necessary, prevailing conflict. Thank you for your steadfast support and partnership, and I look forward to discussing this further in today's hearing. Uh, General Thompson, let me start with an apology. I was looking at my notes rather than the four stars on your shoulder. Uh, so we'll start with that. Uh, thank you. Uh, just noting the Space Force being relative, being new, uh, I'm not sure we know how to measure the readiness in your operations. So we'll want to watch that in the um, months and years ahead so that we're, as you figure out how to define readiness, we'll want to watch that along the way. I'm going to start with uh, my series of questions. I'm going to hold myself to five minutes, and uh, we'll go from that. Um, we're focusing, or at least I'm focusing, I think Mr. Walsh, also on O&M, probably because of the recent activities in the putting together our version, the House version of the NDAA, where O&M was the place where raids occurred. Um, they're targeted uh, for other priorities. Uh, we see this in budgets, we see this in reprogramming, and unfortunately, we see this in the Congress, most recently with the NDAA, when a, this account is often used to offset competing priorities. I believe part of the reason for this is because operations and maintenance accounts are opaque, and it's hard to understand the true impact of these cuts. Therefore, I'd like to know what these impacts are. I'd like to ask each one of you to quickly Give us a real-world example, perhaps one or two, of what the impacts are when maintenance accounts and operation accounts are cut. What does it mean? I'm going to start a little different order here. I'm going to start with the Marine Corps General Smith. If you can give us a couple of examples of what happens when O&M is cut. 
Thanks, Mr. Chairman. When, you, when operations and maintenance budgets are cut, you get one less flight hour for a new pilot. That pilot will eventually achieve 1,000 hours, but they'll achieve it a day or a week or a month later than they otherwise would have. That pilot, while ready, is less ready than he or she should be or could be. If O&M is cut, you may not be able to take the entire unit, a battalion, for example, to an, a major operation or major exercise, pardon me, in the Philippines. So only half or a third of the unit gets the training that was offered to them at Balakatan or Cobra Gold. They are less ready than they otherwise would have been. They, they lack the experience that those O&M dollars would have brought them because spare parts didn't make the airplane ready or because the dollars for the fuel to provide that flight hour were not there. Chairman, uh, two things, two examples. Uh, number one, uh, we talk about facility, facility restoration dollars on the installations. If the budget's less, the, the, the order of merit list, those projects we thought were the most important to attack that year is affected. And so the, the project at the bottom will probably not be resolved until the next year. And so it's a rolling, it's a rolling cachet of, uh, of, of projects on each of our installations or some of our installations that are affected. And the second one, it's, it, it answers your questions, but it's, it's, it's a nuance, and I, I'd like to mention it in this, in this testimony. Uh, but when we, when we uh, execute an emergent requirement, something that's not in the Global Force Management and Allocation Plan, and that's something that's not planned, when we execute that, typically somehow we get compensated for it eventually but not immediately. And so what happens is that impacts our ability to execute our programmed readiness activities because we've got to use the resources we have to cash roll that until we do get compensated. And so that's something that is very complicated as we execute during the course of the year. And as, as you well know, uh, we don't have OCO anymore. And so it's, it's pure base dollars for O&M. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think there was something that occurred this year in Europe that wasn't planned. A good example. Uh, let's go to uh, the Navy. What does it mean when O&M is cut? Yes, sir. Uh, I agree with the, the, the previous comments and appreciate the question. I think when we look at our big readiness accounts like ship maintenance, the flying hour program, ship operations, um, that's one of the reasons why we established the OPN pilot, frankly, in our ship maintenance accounts for private sector uh, surface ships. Um, when, when those things are cut, uh, there are fewer availabilities that we'll be able to afford in the year, and um, that has a cascading impact. Same thing that was uh, previously mentioned on our shore side, where we fund our sustainment and restoration and modernization of our bases. Um, if we don't have sufficient uh, funds, that tends to bow wave and creates a problem for us. So very similar to what uh, was previously stated. Thank you. Air Force. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I'd like to, to build upon what my Marine Corps colleague talked about. He talked about, with respect to aviation, the sort of the, the personnel readiness issue. I would, I would like to couple that with, um, actually, the platform readiness is, is impacted as well. So for example, uh, as the o and uh, budgets are smaller, that means perhaps we aren't able to grow our maintainers as fast, or the ability to, to do the on-site maintenance and get ahead uh, isn't there as well. So what that means is with these aging aircraft, you spend more time in the depot. You have longer depot times. And when something kicks off, I'll, I'll think about our mobility platforms, C-17, C-5. When something like the Operation Allied Refuge with the Afghanistan uh, issue pops up, we have to have those aircraft ready at all times. And so that backlog starts to build up and you can't buy that time back with a fixed amount of depot infrastructure and an increasing requirement for depot maintenance because some of that deferred maintenance has had to go into the depot. Your actual platforms degradation and readiness uh, starts to wane similar to where uh, General Smith was talking about the, the air crew as well. Thank you. Space Force. Mr. Chairman, uh, two quick examples. The first is uh, 
uh, advanced training activities for our for our guardians. Certainly, the the needed proficiency training continues every single day, but those larger scale, more advanced training opportunities, we have to reduce the number. We have to reduce the level of sophistication, so not as much of our force gets that advanced training uh, and to the to the sophistication we need them to have in order to face threats. And then the second is a growing backlog of maintenance sustainment activities, both on the ground based command and control systems for our satellites, but also the sensors and radars and other things that we have on the ground, that maintenance backlog grows and the chances that we're going to have increased downtime and things grows as well. A couple of thoughts, my thoughts on this. First of all, in all of the, all of you, when you submit your budgets, you submit the proposals, they do not call for 100 percent readiness across the line. Uh, you come in at 75 percent or 85 percent, some percentage. And so what you are submitting to us is insufficient in your own view to maintain readiness. And then it winds up with us. And we're sinners as much as you are on this matter. Uh, we'll take your 85 percent and we will whack it and uh, dice it. And the result is it may be 80 percent of what you claim you need. And so I raise this issue for our own discipline as we go into the final drafting of the NDAA and the appropriation process, that the readiness accounts really are critically important. New platforms, equally important. Uh, the good news that I have next to me, I have the chairman of two subcommittees, and I'm sure they're listening. I know that uh, we've talked about it amongst ourselves, and I'm sure Mr. Walsh has on his side with the uh, ranking members. Uh, with that, I will yield uh, uh, to Mr. Walsh, and as we come back around, I'll have some more comments. Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I appreciate all of your calls uh, ahead of time. G uh, General Martin, we, we talked about uh, guard and reserve readiness, uh, and particularly as it pertains to the looming decision on discharging potentially uh, 60,000 guardsmen and reservists uh, over the vaccine mandate. Um, and I fully understand, you know, a, a, as a 26-year veteran myself, uh, good order and discipline and an order is an order. You, you, you order the platoon to charge the machine gun on the top of the hill, they got to follow it. Um, but I also think it's incumbent on us as leaders to constantly evaluate the cost and the risks of our orders. And maybe charging that hill uh, is going to be too costly uh, to, that, to that unit. So I, I think my concern here is that the nature of and the effectiveness um, of the vaccine has evolved. Uh, you know, it started with absolutely it starts, it stops the spread. And of course, we can't have sailors getting into a submarine or airmen getting into a missile pod or getting in the back of the, uh, a Bradley infecting each other. But I think it's pretty clear now that it doesn't stop the spread. It's more of a decision on what type of symptoms you want to uh, incur or risk uh, in, in your personal capacity, making it much more of a personal health decision. Here nor there, uh, my understanding is the decision sits with the secretary. We're talking about states potentially losing up to 20 to 30 percent of their guardsmen and women, replacing them in a uh, very difficult recruiting environment, much less getting them trained to the capability they once were. Uh, I, I don't know how you get there. So I understand it sits with the secretary, but how do you What's your contingency plan to replace those capabilities on that type of scale uh, if the secretary sticks with his decision and discharges uh, 60,000 guardsmen and, and reservists? What's the, what's the backup plan? Congressman, thank you. Uh, she has not made a decision yet, as you well know. We talked about that yesterday. And so she's got to take a lot of things to take into consideration as we move towards that decision. But each and every day, we're making progress in terms of more soldiers choosing to vaccinate or their exemptions are approved. And so we're making progress on those numbers. And 
I think we need to see what happens over time. What's going to be the impact when the new, the new Novavax, if I'm getting the name correct, vaccination comes into play? And how many people are going to change their mind as a result of that being an, a, available as an option, which we believe that'll be? And so uh, we will have to manage our force, but we're talking about the future, and we haven't made that decision yet. She has not made those decisions yet. No, I, under, I understand, General. I'm just asking you about you. you must have contingencies in place. If we suddenly discharge you know, essentially six divisions worth of guardsmen and reservists, how then do we backfill that capability and how long would it take you? I'd like to take that for the record, Congressman. Okay. Uh, and, and, and for the record, I've taken the vaccine. I think uh, you know, th this isn't a, a political issue. I'm just talking about weighing that risk of a guaranteed loss versus relatively healthy men and women um, with a fraction of a percent that are getting seriously ill uh, at, at this point. Uh, I'd like to uh, just stick with you, General Martin. Mr. Chairman, do you think we're going to have to come around for another, for another round? Can you just take a moment uh, and talk about the Army's role in the Indo-Pacific, uh, how critical it is in terms of our security uh, assistance partners, our allies, soldiers waking up in a foxhole next to an American soldier, how the majority of the chiefs of defense and our allies across the Pacific are actually Army officers. I think a lot of people would assume um, that, that they're Navy. And, uh, you know, as we, as we continue to shift in line with the national defense strategy, I think it's important to understand uh, the Army's role in these exercises. And the carry-on there is you having the O&M dollars, you having the readiness uh, to be able to carry them out and have those forces forward. Thank you, Congressman. Land power matters anywhere in the world, and it is, it is my assertion that in order to win in a complicated environment that's in the Pacific, it's going to require a complete joint force, and land power will be a part of that joint force. The Army provides a significant amount of capability in building uh, partner capacity, as I talked about in Ukraine, and we're doing in the Pacific with security force assistance brigades. But it also has capabilities such as long-range precision fires that'll be part of our multi-domain task forces. We have two that are dedicated to the Pacific right now. We have a logistics network that is reliant upon United States Army watercraft and land forces, port opening capabilities and other capabilities on the land to deliver capabilities so the joint force can be supplied. We have supreme command and control capability for joint forces. And of course, we have our traditional forces and air and missile defense capable capabilities that are there. Uh, one thing that we typically, we, we, we tend to, when we look at the map of the Pacific, we see a lot of blue and not a lot of green. But 16 of those 33 countries have CHODs who are land force uh, raised commanders. Uh, most of the militaries in those, in, in those countries in that region are land forces. And if we build upon those partner capacities with the capabilities we have, we believe that we can have even a credit, more credible deterrent and, if necessary, respond to crisis capability in the Pacific. No, thank you, General. And, and, and just in, in, in closing, at least for this round, I think for both the Marine Corps and the Army's force design forward, those... Um, Intertheater and intra-theater lift capabilities are, from what I've seen and been briefed, wholly insufficient at this point to really to fully be able to execute uh, the O plan. So I look forward to following conversations. I know that's something that Sea Power, uh, uh, both uh, the, the chairman and ranking member, have taken a hard look at, and I think I know we have in this committee as well. And look forward to working with you to fill those gaps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Walsh, thank you very much. I'm going to give the. Uh Order uh, the questions here. Uh, Courtney, Wilson, Spear, Scott, McLean. So uh, if your name, you're in there, Mr. Courtney, you're coming up, then Mr. Wilson, Ms. Spear, Scott, and McLean. Joe. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And thank you uh, again to all the witnesses for being here post markup. Of course, this process is still not over. Um, we kind of do NDAA like uh, that video Schoolhouse Rock shows that we actually have a real conference committee, so your, your testimony is, is very valuable. 
Um, Admiral Kreitz, on page three of your written testimony, you describe significant progress on the pace of surface ship maintenance repairs, which is terrific. Um, however, um, there was no mention uh, on the state of attack submarine maintenance, which, as you know, this subcommittee has been focused on for a decade. Um, based on the recently released quarterly submarine maintenance report, there are still significant numbers of attack submarines with over three months of maintenance delays with some vessels still in experiencing years of delays, um, including, of course, the USS Boise, which is kind of the poster child of just uh, how serious this problem is. It's been years. Uh, given the urgent priority f uh, for more subs in regions like the Indo-Pacific, uh, I think we all agree this has to change. I want to focus, however, on an issue which I believe is slowing down submarine maintenance as we speak, and that's the Navy's refusal to provide, quote, unusually hazardous risk indemnification for work in the private yards on attack submarines, specifically on the vertical launch system. The Navy's refusal is a change in 40 years of contract policy, which, my, which myself and others have been warning is going to create a barrier for work to be performed by private contractors. This barrier is now playing out in real time with repairs of the USS Hartford at Electric Boat in Groton, Connecticut. The Navy has not met its June 1st deadlines to have a third party on site at the yard to do the VLS work. That's not surprising since the market for comprehensive UHR insurance coverage is basically non-existent. Um, and because of that reality, I want to emphasize this is not a USS Hartford um, unique one-off case. The Navy made a systemic change to UHR and it's going to impact other repairs work contracts that have previously been fully indemnified and that are going to expire as time goes on. And I think it's blindingly obvious that the Navy is not going to find private contractors if they can't find insurance. And it's just a, it's just a simple uh, reality. I realize, Admiral, this is not sort of your portfolio to do the contracts, but it, but it, but it affects readiness if, if we're going to have, you know, in my opinion, self-imposed delays uh, because of contract um, issues. Um, in the NDAA that we just finished, um, Section 815 uh, of the bill modified the indemnification authority, which basically took it out of the Secretary of the Navy and pushed it up to uh, the Secretary of Defense, which, you know, honestly, I, there's some of us who are, you can't, we're all very pro-Navy, and we're not, but it's a message that this issue really is just screaming out for a, a resolution. And I honestly believe there's a compromise here. Um, you know, we can, we can have contractors um, get insurance, risk insurance, to the maximum that's available in the market, but that, the, the, as was the case for 40 years, that the Navy will be there sort of as a backstop, kind of like TRIA, you know, which is, uh, again, a, a way to, um, you know, cover risk, high-risk um, activity. And, um, again, I, I'm really just sort of bringing this up um, <clears throat> to flag it for the department, which is that, um, you know, we, we're already seeing the delay that, that's happening with Hartford, and it's, uh, there's no contractor that's in place to do the, the vertical launch system, and you have to have that, right? I mean, if you're going to do a full maintenance availability. So I, I just wonder if you could just comment. Yes, Congressman, thanks very much for the question. And let me just say that the, uh, the, the submarine force that we have today is the greatest the world's ever seen. And um, I'm biased, but you can put that in the record. Um, it is impressive, and we need to continue to get our submarines into maintenance, and we need to get them out of maintenance. Uh, we have made progress in the uh, public sector, and um, we've increased our manpower by 40 percent of uh, workers uh, over the last 10 years. We're, we're making improvements. We are going after, you know, data-driven specific efforts to understand where the challenges lie. It's in areas of new and growth work and the way we plan and making sure that we have the parts and pieces available early. With regard to the private sector, we need that capacity. We are close partners with uh, um, Electric Boat as well as uh, Newport News. Um, I would just say that um, with regard to indemnification, you're right. It's not, I, I'm not a contracting expert here. I know that the Secretary of the Navy has been looking at this, um, and what I will do is, is I will take your comments back to the Secretary of the Navy, and we'll come back to you. I appreciate that, and um, you know, again, the door is always wide open in terms of continuing this effort. Thank you, I yield back. I th thank you, Mr. Courtney. Mr. Wilson, you're up. Thank you, Chairman Garamondi, and I'd like to uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity I had to be with uh, you and Patty uh, on the delegation that we visited uh, in Romania for uh, visiting with our Black Sea allies, Romania, Turkey, uh, Bulgaria, uh, Georgia, uh, Ukraine, uh, how important that was uh, to uh, see the security of the Black Sea region. Additionally, I had the opportunity to be with you at the NATO, excuse me, at the uh, OSCE Parliamentary Assembly in England. And then it was uh, so meaningful to me to be with you as we uh, went to Helsinki, Finland, and to uh, Stockholm, Sweden, uh, to welcome Finland and Sweden into NATO, how important that is. Also, uh, Congressman Wall's ranking member, I was really grateful to be with you in Kiev December last year. What a life-changing experience it was for me, and I appreciate your outspoken uh, service on behalf of uh, our country uh, with your background, Green Beret. And then I'd like to um, tell uh, General Martin, thank you for your you and your family's 40 years of service uh, to our country. And I also uh, share your recognition of the resolve of the people of Ukraine for victory, uh, which is just so important for the security of the American people uh, that the people of Ukraine are victorious. With that in mind, I appreciate the leadership of Brigadier General Patrick M Michaelis of the U.S. Army Training Center at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Fort Jackson is the Army's training center of choice for basic combat training and an installation consistently recognized for excellence where 60,000 troops received initial entry training before entering the ready force. Given our increasing challenges with recruitment, what are the initial entry training centers doing to improve the physical uh, readiness while minimizing injuries to the increasingly uh, sedentary uh, pool of recruits? Congressman, thank you, and it's great seeing you again, uh, and appreciate your, uh, your words. So about a year ago, the Training Doctrine Command uh, started a program where we embedded medics and behavior health specialists at the battalion level in each of our training battalions. And uh, the results are undeniable. Uh, in that year, we had 1,700 fewer trainees that were removed from basic training last year compared to 2020. So we're going to continue to uh, resource this program and continue to grow it because uh, any attrition you have in the training pipeline is attrition that you won't receive in the operational units or elsewhere in the Army. And so it's really important that we continue to work, work at this. And Paul Funk in Training and Doctrine Command and Pat Michaelis are leading that effort with that initiative. Thank you very much. And uh, I do want to uh, echo uh, Ranking Member Waltz, too. Uh, I am concerned about uh, removing uh, uh, our troops and uh, that every uh, effort should be made. Uh, to provide for exemptions so that we can maintain the uh, service members that we have. Uh, with uh, General Smith, I'm really grateful that I previously represented Paris Island. Uh, in fact, my uh, son is a uh, Navy doctor there at Beaufort Naval Hospital, and so I have a great appreciation of uh, Marine uh, service. And with that in mind, I'm also grateful to be the Congressional Military Youth Programs uh, Caucus Chairman, and part of that is the Young Marines Program. And I want to I want you to know that I was really grateful the NDAA includes uh, funding for this uh, and authorizes DOD funding and how meaningful this can be for recruitment and also opportunities for young people to serve. With that in mind, what is the status of the um, uh, of this uh, of Marine Corps recruiting and uh, wouldn't it be helpful to have the young Marines uh, be part of this? Congressman, good to see you, sir. Uh, we, we appreciate the support for any program that offers to the American people the true value proposition of service. Uh, Young Marines is one of those examples. Rather than uh, call it a recruiting tool, I, I view it as offering to everyone uh, a genuine glimpse at what the value, the value proposition of service is. Our recruiting challenges this year across the board are in fact difficult, which is why we're so focused on retention rather than recruiting, but we will be on, well, we will make or come very close to making our recruiting mission in, in 22. It will come to a degree at the expense of the pool that we have ready for 23. Anytime you, you have less time in the delayed entry program, you will have a higher attrition rate at recruit training, which is unacceptable. 
So again, I think the focus for us is retention and then ensuring that the American people see the value proposition of service in the United States Marine Corps and the United States military writ large. And thank you all for your service. I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. We now turn to Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all uh, for your service. And um, I don't want to disappoint you, um, so I have a series of questions um, to ask. Um, let's start with you, General Martin. Uh, we just got word on the Military Personnel Subcommittee um, that you're going to have an end strength shortfall that is pretty dramatic, that you're now shifting from an end strength of 473 to somewhere between 445,000 and 452, so a reduction of between 21,000 and 28,000. Uh, that's alarming. Tell us how you're going to address it. Congresswoman, thank you for your question. Uh, first, I'd like to say that uh, it's 445 to 452, but we're going to mission ourselves for 455 if we can achieve it. And the question is, is whether or not we can achieve it. Because right now what we're experiencing, the why of what we think is going on right now is we've got unprecedented challenges with both a post-COVID-19 environment and labor market, but also competition, private competition with private companies that have changed their incentives over time. You've seen that with the various incentives that uh, companies have provided. And then what we call, a decrease, as a result of that, a decreasing propensity and requisite qualifications to serve. That's why we've gone from 29 to 23% of the population that is available to serve, and that's not even propensed. And so that projection for 23 is correct. We believe that we'll land at 466.4 this year for an end strength uh, if we make our recruiting objectives. And of course, that will impact, if we're over or under, that will impact next year's end strength as well. We're taking that all into account. Okay, General Martin, I'm gonna um, have to move on, but I think that, Mr. Chairman, we might need to have a subsequent hearing on this because it's pretty serious. And if we need to make some changes to be able to attract more talent, then we need to look more we'll carefully at that. Um, let me move on to you, Vice Admiral Kreitz. Um, two questions for you. Uh, the Air Force and the Army have instituted a policy that requires leave to be presumptively approved for women who are seeking a medical procedure such as an abortion or other reproductive health. Uh, they're not required to tell their commanders the specific reason for their needed leave. Um, I'm not sure what the Navy's policy is. Can you enlighten us? Do you have presumptive leave? I guess the question is. Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Um, that is determined between the health provider and the member. So the health provider will determine the amount of leave required as the result of a miscarriage, for example. No, but my question is, are you presumptively going to provide leave and not ask any questions as the Army and the Air Force are doing? I mean, I'd love to see some consistency on this policy. Let me, uh, I, I believe that today the policy that we have is, is that that decision is managed at the health care provider. So the answer, I believe, is no. But what, let me come back to you with the details of um, why and the logic, um, if you will, please. All right. The Army and Air Force also have established a policy of between one week and six weeks of conv convalescent leave following a miscarriage, depending on the circumstances. Would you please report back to us on what the Navy's policy? If we don't have something consistent across the services, we are making a huge mistake. So um, I would ask you to do that. Uh, the GA reported that the typical service warfare officer gets less than five hours of sleep at night. Um, I want to know what you're doing to enforce the Navy's fatigue management policy. Absolutely. That, yeah, thanks again. That was a uh, 2020 uh, GAO report that was done. There have been a number of efforts that uh, are underway. We currently have a revised policy and watch standing uh, for our surface warfare uh, officers and for all folks assigned to the ships are required to get 7.5 hours of uninterrupted sleep. We're also working watch bill uh, software which will allow us to better understand in real time as we work the, the details of who's on watch, how many um, if, if people are being impacted. There are a number of different efforts that are underway, including 
trying to lighten up some of the mission sets that the ships are required to do at sea, incre increasing the number of uh, training opportunities that are in port. So this is uh, definitely a focus area. And um, so are, are they get, getting 7.5 hours of sleep? Yes, ma'am. And you're auditing that? Yes, ma'am, including the, fa yes, ma'am. All right, um, I have another question on the suicides at USS George Washington. I'll wait for the second round. Thank Is you, Mr. Going to be a second round? Uh, we're going to go for two hours, and I'm sure there's going to be a second round. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Chairman. Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Scott, let me uh, give the uh, order here. Scott, Kalehi, McLean, Moore. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Martin, you've talked about the reduction from 29% to 23% in the 17 to 24 year olds that are eligible to serve uh, the military health systems named Genesis, might be more appropriately named Exodus. Uh, how much of this reduction comes from the change in review of this is the health question. status? <laughs> Thanks for the question, Congressman. So as you know, MHA Genesis is new. And uh, so what I'll tell you is I think that it is beneficial for us because it's helping us see things that we couldn't see before. But what we're, what we're struggling with a bit is learning how to live with Genesis and understanding the timelines that are associated with some of these background checks that result from the checks in the system. And so we've leaned the process down almost to 50% of what it was before, but it can still take longer. But what we're doing is we're, we are uh, putting some measures in place. We're committing some resources at different levels. We're asking for licenses for MHS Genesis at the battalion level where medical professionals can access it so that we can see some of these, these waiver requirements in advance so that we're not waiting till the soldier or the prospect arrives at the MEP station to do that. So we're working with Genesis. We've got a path forward. I feel very good about that path forward, but it has had an impact on our, pro our, our, our uh, ability to rapidly move soldiers through that process at the MEP station, which typically took about 14 days in the past. And it was about three times that when we first started. If you had an all-state athlete that had a sprained ankle that they were treated for, would that person be caught up in the Genesis system and slow down their, their process? Congressman, I'd have to have someone from our recruiting command or from uh, health, help the, the Surgeon General Office talk to you about the specifics of the different checks that they make. But I don't think that would fall into that category. I, I'd, I've, I've heard serious complaints about the Genesis system and how, and from, from other commanders and, and what it's doing to the recruitment. I'd, I'd be interested to know if, if issues like a, a, a sprained ankle, uh, an athletic injury that uh, did not require surgery, or something as simple as a broken bone w was creating problems in the system with, with getting uh, our recruits in. Have, have any of the rest of you uh, got comments on the Genesis system with regard to what it has done to the recruitment? Is it consistent among all of the branches that it's slowing? I, I, Congressman, I'll just chime in. I would just reiterate what, what John Martin said, is that I believe this is a transitory issue in that as we understand the value proposition that this provides with the information made available against the processes which we are, have been using, which may not have had all the exact same data and information coming in, so the recruiter is asked to go back and, and re-engage, and so that additional time is actually exacerbating the problem of keeping the recruit, potential recruit interested. However, I, I do believe, uh, just like uh, Paul said, I do believe that on the other side of this, this will allow more rapid access and allow us to be able to, to match our policies and our procedures with what this capability provides as far as uh, insights into. So I think on the other end, it's, we will be better off. I want, to, uh, I want to go back to what Congressman Walt said at the start about the, the vaccines. I had COVID. I was hospitalized with it. I was on oxygen for 14 days. Uh, and the day I was eligible for vaccines, I got vaccinated. And, and I haven't had it since. And so whether it's the vaccines or the fact that I had such a bad case, uh, either way, I haven't had to deal with, with COVID since then. I'm particularly concerned about the way people who had exemptions to vaccines prior to COVID have been treated since COVID vaccine. 
There's a small number in our service that had religious exemptions to vaccines that had always been honored until the COVID vaccine mandate in the military came out. Still the soldiers didn't change their position. It was the military that changed their position in, in that particular case with those soldiers. And I want to just be very clear that I think that if a soldier had an exemption to vaccines prior to COVID being the COVID vaccine mandate, that exemption should be honored. And uh, it is the DOD that has taken the political position, not the soldier, uh, when they change that. With that, I'll yield the remainder of my time. Thank you, Mr. Scott. A little change in the order here. Mr. Kalehi, Ms. McLean, Ms. Strickland, and Mr. Moore. So, Mr. Kalehi, you're up. Mahalo, Chairman Garamendi, Ranking Member Waltz, for holding this important hearing and for inviting the service chiefs to discuss the current state of military readiness in our nation. My question, I'd like to jump um, to Red Hill on the island of Oahu, and it's for Admiral Kreitz. Sir, I understand that Secretary Austin has directed a joint task force called Joint Task Force Red Hill that will be stood up on the island of Oahu and led by a senior flag officer that will report to the SECDEF through Admiral Aguilino, the Ad indo pacom commander. Are you able to provide us with any update on the status of this joint task force and its formation? Thank you, Congressman, uh, for, the, for the question. I don't have um, the latest information. I will get it and I will get it to you. Um, it's been, I know this has been discussed. I, I think um, I'll just leave it at that and I'll get you uh, what we have as soon as I, I, I can, sir. Okay, no, no problem. Second question, um, you know, this incident at Red Hill uh, that led to um, a, a, a major, major catastrophe on the island of Oahu that affected over 98,000 military service members that depend and, um, and, and live on the Navy's water system started on the 20th of November. It was a result of a broken AFFF fire suppression line that we now know the Navy uh, installed and contractors installed violating the Department of Defense's fire code when they installed PVC piping in what should have been a steel pipe through a new fire suppression system in the Red Hill lower adit that was uh, installed um, a few years ago. The collected wastewater and fuel as a result of a previous um, event at Red Hill, which happened on May 5th of last year, um, transported and held a fuel water mixture in this line. We've continuously asked the question, and I wanted to ask it again, if you had any information to confirm that the release from the broken AFFF line contained only a mixture of fuel and water, petroleum product, but did not contain any type of fire retardant, such as PFAS. Again, thank you for the question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, again, I'll have to come back to you. I know, I will just tell you that, um, you know, the health and safety of, the, the, of our people, the families, um, and our community neighbors is, you know, extremely important to us. We know that we've lost trust here, and we want to be transparent and work with the, with the state as well as um, the Office of Secretary of Defense to get this uh, corrected. I don't have the information that you're asking for, but I will get it for you. I'll just add, and I really appreciate that, you know, it, it, this has been an uh, extremely difficult process, um, getting accurate information out here in Hawaii to start to restore that trust with the island community. For months, I had asked for video footage that could have existed either from the um, the tunnel system or from, uh, you know, an individual cell phone that the Navy for months um, stated did not exist. And then all of a sudden, about two weeks ago, uh, video footage from the actual leak itself on November 20th um, was released in a local media source here. And so, you know, having transparent information, especially with this PFAS question is really important because the Navy is now saying that less than 5,000 um, gallons of fuel actually leaked into the Red Hill um, well 
but it affected so many people so quickly. It's hard to understand how that uh, little amount of fuel affected so many military service members and, um, and, and their families. And so ensuring that PFAS, which is um, a very, very dangerous chemical, obviously known to cause cancer, was not in that pipe and did not enter the Red Hill well and ultimately was not consumed by our military service members and their families is really, really important for those families to know that. So I would um, appreciate if we're able to definitively come to uh, uh, an answer that there was no PFAS in that um, fire suppression system line. Congressman, I'll get, again, I'll get you the information regarding the video. Um, my understanding is, is that the, uh, the fact that a video existed was part of the initial report that was provided, or the initial, initial investigation that was provided uh, to the state as well as to this committee back in the March timeframe. It's not clear to me um, if our, you know, why our briefer misspoke or what occurred there, but I will, um, I'll, I'll make sure that we get the information on PFAS to you. Thank you. And I'll yield back uh, my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kalehi. Before we move to Ms. McLean, a couple of things. The contamination issues are widespread. Uh, each of the services and multiple bases uh, are contaminated, water supplies and the like. Uh, it's an ongoing issue. It's uh, not the principal subject matter of today's hearing. But all of you gentlemen know that we're going to go back through this over and over and over again uh, until I guess we're gone. It'll be a long while after we're gone that the uh, pollution will be gone. So be prepared. We're coming back at it. Ms. McLean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Um, an essential responsibility of the subcommittee is to ensure that appropriate resources are authorized to meet mission readiness requirements. Yet, unfortunately, we consistently lack the level of detail in the annual budget request to conduct this critical oversight work. When procuring a weapon system, there is a single line of funding, there's a single line of funding to develop that system and a single line to buy the system. But to operate and sustain that same system, there are multiple funding lines, sometimes 14 or more, each of which is executed by a different entity and each of which is buried in a larger pot of money so that it is difficult for Congress um, to have visibility into the amounts or the outcomes. Um, I think it's our job to make sure that we're getting value for our money. Um, and I really think the first question that we need to ask ourselves and, and answer is, what are the DOD mission readiness requirements in support of the National Defense Strategy? To that end, in, in FY21 NDAA, we codified a requirement in Section 118 of Title 10 U.S. Code for the service to submit readiness objectives and metrics for every major weapons system along with budget materials, starting with the FY23 FY request. In our last subcommittee hearing, I asked Sec Secretary Marani why DOD has yet to submit the materials required by Section 118 of, the t of t uh, Title 10. He didn't have an answer. He said he would get back to me. I'm still waiting. Um, so I will ask all of you gentlemen this question. When can we expect your services to comply with this requirement? And maybe you have and I haven't seen it. You want to go down the line, Congress? Sure. <laughs> so for the Army, I'll have to take that for the record. I don't have the answer to that question, but we'll get you an answer. Thank you. I'll just say for the Navy, again, thanks for the question. I think it's, uh, it's an important. Uh, it's important for us to understand uh, and what the outcomes are of the readiness investments that we're making. I think we have that information. Um, I, I believe, uh, you know, our budget justification material provides most of that, but I'll go back and, and, and as uh, General Martin stated, I don't have the specifics and we'll go back and, and work with uh, OSD on the policy as well as uh, the, the Navy to get you a, a correct answer. Over. And then I'll also come back to you, but I will say I'll, I want to make sure that we're in compliance with Section 118. I'm familiar with it uh, as far as objective 
initial and then full operating capabilities, objective uh, options, uh, and then full capability options for requirements for a specific system. We always have a threshold and then an objective. Threshold is acceptable, always moving toward an objective. Cost analysis for each of those, and that's part of our JROC process. You, you must so, show. So do you have it? We have, all, what I know, ma'am, is per system, we can tell you what that system is supposed to do, what it should cost. What I can't confirm for you is that it's been placed into one bin, or one binder, in compliance with Section 118. That I will come back to you, but the data is, is there. It, and again, I think it's, and I, I'll apologize, I'll continue before I make my last comment. Uh, no, I, I think uh, the same The same as General Smith. We have subcomponents of parts of, of requirements for aircraft availability, mission capable rates, et cetera. But as far as having that roll up, uh, ma'am, we, we need to make sure that we have that in it uh, per, per section 118. If, if there's a, a format template, I'm not sure that we have complied with that as far as the comprehensive piece, ma'am. Congressman, we're in the same position. I need to understand exactly what you're asking for and make sure that we provide what it is. And, and again, I think our frustration, or I'll start with mine, is we're spending a lot of taxpayer dollars, which I'm happy um, to spend to secure our, our nation. But the frustrating piece is we need to go back and we need to make sure that we are getting value for our dollars and that there's a metric that Congress lays out, which I think is, is pretty clear, I think it's extremely disappointing that all five of you don't have the requirement. So I will ask my second follow-up question is, when can we expect to get it? Because when, when, when I asked in the last subcommittee, it was committee hearing, it was, well, I don't have it, but I'll get it to you, and um, I'm, still wait, I'm still waiting. So my follow-up question is, when will I have, or when will we have the requirement by law that you're supposed to give to us? I'm looking for a specific date. Congresswoman, without understanding exactly where we're at in the process, I mean, it could be today if we've got it, but I've got it. I've so got when it. will you have an answer for me on when you will get me an answer? I How's that? I can have someone answer you by the end of the day today. Perfect. Similar, we'll provide an answer by the end of the day. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we'll, Ma'am, we'll come back to you as soon as, and it may not be today, but days, to tell you what the time How about by the end of the week? Is that fair? <laughs> we just got to put a deadline or it'll well, go on into okay, perpetuity. Okay, let's, uh, let's move this ahead. along here. Yes, ma'am. Back and forth, not going to work. Uh, the information was required by law. Please provide it as soon as possible. Uh, a couple of things beyond uh, this one requirement, the Section 118. One of the things that uh, is very much on my mind is that when new weapon systems are acquired, rarely does the long-term maintenance of that system considered. And it absolutely has to be. Uh, if we're gonna have a bridge tanker, and it's different than the existing tanker, what is necessary to maintain that? All the way down the line. And I think this is part of what that section 118 gets to. Uh, not only the new systems coming in, but uh, existing systems. Uh, and to the extent that we can identify them, it may also be helpful. For example, the A-10, what's it cost to maintain it? And that may give us the answer we ought to get rid of it or not. Okay. Uh, moving on to um, Ms. Strickland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to our witnesses, and I'm going to ask two lines of questioning, and hopefully we won't run out of time. I want to talk about the backlog of housing that exists at JBLM and other bases, and then the Army role in the Indo-Pacific. So I understand that Liberty Military Housing and JBLM are two years into a six-year, $100 million renovation project, and these are long overdue. But after I sent a letter, um, there was an assertion that we only had a projected deficit of 245 homes by 2025. And as of today, there's a 700 76 housing deficit. And I say this because I get calls in my district office from families moving to JBLM about the cost of housing and the availability. And we know that on post, we never want to sacrifice readiness or preparedness, but there's an opportunity to build more housing at JBLM. So General Martin, what do you think it's going to take for DOD to add more housing on and off base to adequately house our service members? Thank you. 
Congresswoman, thank you for your question and uh, making sure that our soldiers and their families have affordable housing to stay in is the top priority for the United States Army. That being said, in most of our installations, 70% of the personnel live off post. JBLM is one of those unique areas where the cost of living is, is very high, and so it's something that's on the mind of the senior commander there. It's on the mind of the partner there. But the numbers that you lay out for me, I can't tell you in this venue with what the information that I have, what their plan is to go beyond that. But as it pertains to the Army as a whole and your line of questioning, uh, we're trying to make sure that we've got the right balance of housing on post that is occupied to the appropriate level so that the vendor can provide the capability, or the partner can provide the capability, but also provide affordable housing to our soldiers in a, in a, in a very safe and secure environment. But if you, if you want an answer on JBLM and, as to whether or not there's going to be any changes there, I, I can get that for you. I just don't have that information with me today. All right, thank you. And in the Puget Sound region where JBLM is, is located, there's a housing shortage of 250,000 units in the entire metropolitan region. So even though they may live off post, there's still a crisis and it's still expensive. So if there's a way to adopt urban land use rules where we go higher and more dense on post, we can help alleviate that problem. Um, my second question is basically around, um, in the Army's opinion, has the Russian invasion of Ukraine changed Japan's thinking on defense and national security, especially how it relates to Japan's southwest islands and how it would play in a possible invasion of Taiwan? Congresswoman, I, I can't speak for what, what Japan's uh, uh, position is or opinion is. That they're going to they're gonna follow the rules of their own sovereignty and the decision-making that they would make. But what I can tell you is we have a very strong relationship with Japan. We would recently had their chief of staff uh, come visit us in the Pentagon, had great engagement with them. Uh, United States Army Japan has a great relationship with the Japanese. And so we're talking to them all the time. And we're at, in our exercises, we're starting to exercise more and more with them on a uh, bilateral basis. And they're, they're, they're a very important partner in the region, particularly when you talk about the Southwest Islands and what, what uh, posture potential that gives for them and for us. And so the Army's role in the Pacific, you, you started to talk about that, but then you asked your question about the Japanese. The Army's got a huge role in the Pacific, yep. command and control, integrated air missile defense, logistics, long-range precision fires, our multi-domain task forces, all part of a potent joint force that can provide a credible deterrent and, if necessary, respond to aggression in the Pacific. Thank you. I yield back my time. Thank you, Ms. Strickland. Mr. Moore. Uh, Mr. Moore, I believe you may not be asking a question. One, two, three. Sorry, Mr. Moore. We now start a second round of questions. Uh, there are so many things to get into here. Uh, I'm going to take it in a slightly different way. Uh, each of the readiness issues that all of you address within your own service are critically important. And each of those readiness issues are part of a larger multi-domain program. And I'm going to take my questions in that direction. Uh, start here with I guess where the first piece of information comes from and that might be a, a satellite. Uh, are you prepared in a multi-domain that is with each of the other four services to be ready to provide them with the information they need to prepare for a conflict that is to be ready and if necessary provide them with the information they need to be able to conduct their operations in a coordinated fashion. General Thompson. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Chairman, since the creation of the Space Force, we've taken several actions to do specifically that. The first one I'll talk to occurred about a year ago when the Vice Chairman, who is also the Chairman of the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, appointed the Space Force as the integrator for joint space requirements. And so in that process, I am now accountable to the service chiefs here and to the, to the Vice Chairman to first of all collect and validate and present to the JROC all of their requirements for space-related 
uh, information, communications, positioning, navigation, and timing, data relay. And so that's the first thing that we've been appointed to do. And we are working through right now the initial phases of what's tactical ISR, what are their, their requirements. That's the first thing we did. The second thing that we did is institute a force design process through our Space Warfighting Analysis Center that also includes all of the services and combatant commands to talk about the specific designs that will fulfill the requirements and their needs from space. And we have already done two of those force design studies and we have three others in work. And then the last thing is, of course, ensuring those designs are resilient and defendable and able to stand up against attack. So those are three things that we have done and continue to do immediately to address the challenge. Just to go down the line, General Alvin. Yeah, and Mr. Chairman, obviously would, uh, it's good to start with, with the Space Force because, as we know, there will be an increased reliance on space to do just about anything we need to do. Uh, in, in a similar sort of educational journey uh, for our Air Force, we're, we are recognizing that um, uh, with the changing character of war, that's going to privilege speed and tempo and agility as well as lethality that uh, we cannot uh, hoard information or try and make independent uh, actions from the other services. It has to be joint from the beginning. We have something uh, through the joint staff and the joint warfighting concept that's sort of a North Star, but it really highlights the idea that from the beginning, we need to understand who needs to get what information and when, because whoever has the decision advantage and can keep the opposing side on the reactive rather than the proactive is going to be, uh, that's going to, whether it's not decisive, it's certainly going to be major impactful. And so that we see that as anything we're doing from our information systems, our data transport layers in the air, or passing on sensors to shooters, that has to not just go with the Air Force, it has to go to any type of shooter that might be the best one to prosecute the target at the time. General Smith. Sir, when you're talking about multi-domain operations, multi-domain effects, I mean, that all of us uh, sit in the JROC and, and in, in support of the joint warfighting concept, that is, in fact, what we are doing. We are a little bit unique in that as the crisis response forward deployed force. We need a, uh, an integrated multi-domain element which we call expeditionary advanced base operations mimics, uh, or, or General Martin and I would share, I think, that the, we looked at the threat in the Indo-Pacific, saw the same threat, and began to build expeditionary advanced base operations or stand-in forces, multi-domain task force, and I won't speak for Joe, because um, uh, he does so eloquently. Um, that integrates everything that you talked about from space, Marines who have space qualifications, all the way down to long-range fires, resilient communications. That uh, multi-domain effect has to be achieved by those forces who are forward, present, and ready who begin the process of disrupting an adversary so the rest of the force can flow behind. So we, we do do that and are very concerned about that to, to DT's uh, comment, General Thompson's comment about um, alternate precision navigation and timing. It, you have to have it because we will be cut off from space operations for short periods of time and while they fight to reestablish we're obligated to carry that mission on in a maritime uh, domain. You just happened to tickle one of my favorite subjects, GPS. Go ahead, Admiral. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I don't have a lot more to add, but I would say that uh, the Naval Service may be the largest consumer of uh, what space brings to the table. With our ships forward deployed, we need to be able to plug and play and be able to do those things. And uh, it was mentioned a couple of times that uh, this is a joint effort. Um, we, can't, we, we need to come together to make sure that the systems that we're putting on our ships are able to you know, communicate with the satellite, but also with the radios that he has or, or whatever. And, um, and so that's, a, that's an ongoing effort, and um, I, I, I'm encouraged on, on the direction that we're going. Over. General Martin. Chairman, uh, I agree with everything that's been said, brilliantly stated to my left. But I, I would like to add something that, you know, we're, tomorrow, if we go to war in the Pacific, we're going to go to war with the joint force that we have. Um, and so our, our thought is every day we've got to be ready, one, two. And every day we have an opportunity to modernize, change our doctrine, change our training. Is, is, is progress in the right direction? 
But one thing that I'm very mindful of that we got to continue to work on so you have the most credible joint force is we're going to go to war with the posture we have and the multinational partners that we have. And that's why engagement is so important in the Pacific right now because we've got some traditional partners that we've, that we've fought with for years and years. We've got partners we fought against that we now fight with. Uh, just time changes. Uh, but we need to continue to develop relationships there because I believe there's a lot of benefit associated with that. And so that's why these engagements, the Security Force Insistence Brigades and what they do, and then the bilateral training that leads to multilateral training. And five years ago, I wouldn't tell you that Indonesia asked us, would ask us to help them build a combat training center and also uh, help them set up a multilateral training exercise. That's going on as we speak. That's the potential of building these relationships and increasing our opportunities for posture. This discussion uh, probably would take several hours, which we don't have. I wanted to raise it. Uh, and General Martin, thank you for bringing it beyond just the five services. It also is our, our allies and uh, those we would like to have as allies. Uh, it's going to require, uh, I want to come back with a series of briefings. Formal hearings are hard to schedule, but I want to uh, alert the members of my subcommittee and uh, other committees that we'll be carrying on a series of briefings uh, on a range of subjects. When we talk about readiness, we're talking about basically every piece of this puzzle, except the acquisition of new equipment, which must have a readiness component before it's ever acquired. Um, a change here, I noticed Mr. Johnson has arrived. Mr. Walsh, it is your turn. We'll pass it to Mr. Johnson then. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. Apologize for being late. I was stuck on the on the floor. Uh, I would rather be here because readiness is so important. Um, General Martin, thanks for your uh, time speaking with me yesterday in advance of this hearing. Um, I, I expressed our concern. I think it's uh, not a concern just that I have, but a number of my colleagues about the recruiting crisis um, and, and the challenge that that places to readiness to, to fight and win wars. So the Army's only met, as we understand it, 40 percent of its recruiting goal for this fiscal year. and. Yesterday, as we discussed, I think uh, just 23 percent of young Americans are eligible to serve without a waiver right now. So, uh, of course, barring the over 40 percent of men between the ages of 18 and 24 who remain unvaccinated against COVID, it makes that percentage even lower. So at least 75,000 soldiers by our count currently face discharge for refusing to take the COVID vaccine. The question is, um, can the Army afford to discharge these soldiers in light of all those recruiting difficulties? Or how, how are we going to grapple with this? Congressman, uh, first, I failed Congressman Waltz when I did not give him a number. When he told me 64, you said 75. I tell you, it's, 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 it's less than 20,000. That's still a significant number, and that's why I'm looking forward to uh, improvements. Uh, and that number for the National Guard is a little over 11,000, Congressman. Um, you, but Chairman, would you Sure, yeah. General, I think it's important to be clear here. So what's the total? Guard is 11 and reserve is 20? No. Oh, total. Total force. Okay. Total force is approximately 20. 20 at this point. Yes, Thank sir. you. Well, that's a different number than we've been told, so that might be part of the problem. Well, um, that's, I, that's why I did, after yeah. our phone call, I said, I've got to double check some numbers here because that was a big number that you had put up. Sure. Well, if the Army fails to meet its recruiting goal, COVID vaccine or not, um, will it make cuts to force structure? And, and how would those cuts affect our, our readiness overall? We don't need to do that immediately. But if we don't arrest the decline that we're seeing right now in end strength, that could be a possibility in the future. But we don't see the need in the near term. Uh, in the near term, the way we're going to manage any shortfalls that we have is the way, ways we've done it in the past where we prioritize formations that have missions or preparation for missions, and those missions will be prioritized to be manned. But that's, that's what we've done in the past. That's what we did back uh, during, uh, during the surge when we were building structure in the Army and we had to continue to deploy it over to Iraq and Afghanistan. But that's how we'll manage that. 
Thank you. I'm running out of time quickly. I wanted to switch topics to the Ukraine conflict. It's a stark reminder of the importance, of course, of maintaining our military readiness and how quickly munitions are depleted, vehicles destroyed in a large-scale conflict. I had a question for each of you. Maybe I'll just go down the line until I run out of time. Uh, Admiral Kreitz, uh, the Ukrainian armed forces have estimated that Russia has fired well over 2,000 precision-guided missiles into Ukraine. If we expended 2,000 TLAMs over a three-month period, how quickly could we replace them, and what levers does the Navy have to expedite production? Thanks, Congressman, for the question. I think um, I don't have the specific numbers off, off the top of my head of what the production cap capacity is. I know that uh, we're at capacity today either uh, building new uh, TLAMs or uh, converting um, uh, older uh, TLAMs. I want to say it's around 450 uh, per year. Over. Thank you. Let me go to uh, General uh, Alvin, if the Air Force needed to make up combat losses of that magnitude, they, it seems the Russians have lost aircraft somewhere at the rate of 25 to 35 combat aircraft at an annual rate that's 100 a year. How long would it take us to manufacture 100 fighter or attack aircraft beyond current levels of production, and what would the lag time be? So th that would also depend on the type uh, of aircraft, but obviously as opposed to munitions, the, an aircraft, especially if it's a fifth gen, is a much longer proposition. So there are many things that go into that. How hot is the production line? Is it up to max capacity? Do you have to do a second production line? So um, the, the nature of, of which um, production line we're talking about would vary that, but I think your underlying question is the key one, the fact that what Ukraine, I think, has really done is opened up our eyes to make sure that we have to have as much of a flexible and robust and adaptive industrial base to be able to, to adapt to this, whether it be munitions or on the platforms. I think that's right. I'm almost out of time, but I'll just say Russia has these reconstitution and production issues today, but of course they could be ours tomorrow. That's the reality. And, and we're just really hopeful the department is taking a hard look at how we can expand the capacity of our defense industrial base if the need arises. It's a dangerous time. I, and with my 15 seconds, I just want to say we're so grateful to all of you for your leadership in very difficult times, and we want to be here to support you. So thank you for your time today. You'll back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Those issues are pertinent to this committee. Uh, when we do briefings uh, in the days ahead, we'll pick those up. Thank you. Mr. Walsh. Your turn. Uh, we're going into a second round now. Mr. Okay, Walsh. great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to, um, I, I think, ask a broader question on, on, uh, on aircraft maintenance. The, the GAO uh, has reported 46 types of aircraft, and I know that's, um, you know, broad brush in their study found that three met their annual mission capable goals. And I, I think this is along the lines of, of Ms. McLean. It's very difficult for us to determine here amongst all of these platforms, the prioritization, the maintenance, how they're measured, um, and, and, and frankly, what to block and tackle and to defend in these, in these O&M dollars. But so, so that's three annual mission capable goals. Uh, at, granted that the data is a, is a bit dated, um, 24 did not meet their annual mission capable goals in any fiscal year. Uh, I, I think this most broadly affects the Air Force, um, where we're seeing 130 percent, by the data I have, 130 percent increase in your maintenance and your sustainment goals. And I get, I know this gets at the heart of divest to invest, um, particularly as your fleet's what averaging 30 years old and you've been stagnating now, I think despite a number of initiatives and, and money, we, we have reinvestment. That divest to invest, it, invest isn't a new concept. You've been doing that over some time, yet we're stagnating at around 70 percent. So I'll, I'll start with you, General Alvin. How do we, how, how do we break this deadlock um, that we seem to be stuck in, in in terms of readiness rates? And I think the chairman perhaps got at it. Are you, are you basically negotiating against yourself both within the building and then with OMB in terms of what you come to us in the first place. But I'll start with you, but I'd like to go to, to each of the services as it pertains. I mean, what are the, you know, if you could give me your top challenge or two in terms of aircraft maintenance and improving sustainment outcomes and availability for your aircraft. Thank you, Congressman. And I, I will sound like a broken record, but the age of our fleet, uh, 
So the programmed life cycle maintenance uh, uh, projection, they sort of go out the window once the aircraft is sustained past its desi design life. And then we find that when it breaks, because of the anticipated uh, maintenance issues with it, we're only anticipated for what would go on over X years. Now when you have X plus 10 or X plus 15 years, there are new and different ways that it finds to break. And those breaks, also, they require more time to be in depot maintenance. And because it's in depot maintenance, you can only have so many go through. So when you have only have, you have fewer available to make it through, it gets clogged in the depot maintenance pipeline. So part of that has to do, and I, that is the, the major one, is every year we try to be able to retire those legacy systems. And every year that we don't, we just don't park them. We try again to maintain them, and it costs more to maintain them. And so all of those things just continue a spiral. And so it actually just gets worse every year, even if we were to put the same or slightly increasing dollars into it. The second is some of the new systems that we have have uh, contract logistic uh, support to go with it. And so as you bring on the new systems, there's new money that has to go to that to even to the new systems as well. But the number one, it would be, it is that age of the fleet because it's, it just takes longer to get them through. The number two would probably be the, the new onboarding of the, of the new systems. And number three is that our maintenance workforce is still, a bulk of it is still under, says, under six years. So we're trying to get experienced workforce onto those airplanes. And as we have to maintain more, we can't put our experienced workforce onto the new aircraft. And so they're just still, that experienced workforce is trying to retain, uh, keep them flying even though they're less relevant. But that number one is it's the age uh, of the existing fleet. Thank you. General Smith. Congressman, I'll, I'll echo that. The, the maintainers, the population of maintainers is, is key. Having them be experienced, multiple years of service underneath an apprenticeship program so that they become the, the true expert in their field. When you maintain legacy aircraft, for us, and legacy is not bad. Legacy doesn't mean it serves no value, uh, gets a kind of a bad rap. It means it is not part of our future plan going forward. Doesn't mean it didn't serve well. Harriers, phenomenal platform, but they have outlived their usefulness. Our F-18s, we've got to transition to Gen 5 aircraft, the F-35. The longer we maintain those older aircraft because of operational demand signals, those experienced maintainers are still maintaining Harriers when they should be maintaining F-35s because they have to go through a pretty robust, along with pilots, transition program from one airframe to another. If I pointed to a single, uh, a, the single biggest challenge, I would say it is the maintainers and the inability to harness all of the experienced maintainers from legacy platforms because it's a glutch and gas uh, sundown program and move them to the, the new platforms, you will see readiness increase as soon as we can divest of the legacy platforms. That's a fact, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, th I think with that, Admiral Kreitz, I'm going to yield to allow Ms. Spear uh, some time before we have to vote. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. You're exactly right. Ms. Spear. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again. I'm going to try and do three topics, so I want um, you to be um, as brief as you possibly can be. Uh, I want to talk suicides, accidents, and child care. Uh, let's start with um, suicide. Uh, General Martin, as you know, I went to Alaska and um, visited both Anchorage and um, Fairbanks. Uh, we were told that you were going to bring a team of behavioral health um, service members to help with the uh, fact that they're waiting two to three months to get um, services. So did the team make it to Alaska? Has the wait time decreased? Congresswoman, the team has arrived at the end of May's when they arrived, and uh, it's too, we don't have data that's uh, mature enough to be able to say, look at the decrease in the, in the wait time. But in terms of physics, it's going to happen, and we'll report out to you as we, as we progress with this so that you, you can be, maintain visibility of that. Any, um, what's the number of suicides so far this year? In Alaska? In Alaska. In Alaska, you've had one. So far this year? One. Uh, Vice Admiral Kreitz. Yes, Congresswoman, thank, thank you. Um, I think we're very focused. This has definitely got the attention of SECNAV and the, and the CNO. Um, you know, we're, we're focused on the health and welfare of our, our, of our people. In my opening comments, I, I, I made reference to some of the things that we have going on, including um, moving a number of our active duty medical personnel, both, uh, you know, uh, uh, trained in the field, 
doctors and others to the waterfront, um, embedding them with uh, on the ships. So I think we're we're we're, we're focused here. Um, there are a number of other things that that we're looking okay, let at. Let me interrupt you because yes, I'm going to run out of time. I'm so sorry. Uh, at the um, USS George Washington, there's been a failure to invest in housing, parking, and quality of life facilities. Um, the ship appears to be grossly un undermanned, especially at the supervisory, senior enlisted levels. When it takes an hour and a half to go from the parking lot to get to the ship, that's kind of like unconscionable. Um, what are we doing to fix that? Have we bought a hotel, a parking lot, something to make? Because th this shipyard's going to be there indefinitely. Are we doing anything about that? Yes, ma'am. We are. Um, we have offered and moving uh, the, the individuals or the uh, ship crew off the ship right now as we work through uh, quality of life issues that you mentioned, such as parking. It is a challenge. We're working uh, shuttle services, but we're also working with the shipyard themselves on a potential to put in a parking garage. We're looking at other qual quality of life initiatives, including um, setting up a center where we can get some rest and relaxation. You know, we, we, the sailors are you know, working hard to get these ships out of their availabilities, and uh, we understand and we definitely appreciate their sacrifices. We need to do a better job of providing them uh, the quality of life things that, so that are required. seven suicides at the USS George Washington, is that correct? I don't have the number. All right, I would like I the numbers from each of you for how many suicides we've had so far. General Smith? Ma'am, we've had uh, 31 so far this calendar year. 31 suicides so far this Across the active and reserve component, the total force, 31. Uh, last year, a total of 58, the year before, 73. So those are the, the numbers. My, my biggest concern, and I, I think you noted it with uh, General Martin's comment about Alaska, is the delay in, in receiving care. And that comes from a smaller medical community, active component, um, drives a bigger delay. Uh, so our OSCAR units, operational stress control units, are simply not available to each and every unit who would need them as we shrink down the medical force. All right, telemedicine's got to be part of the solution as we move forward. Uh, General yes, Alvin? Uh, and, and I need to get you the exact numbers. I know that 21 was better than 20, 22 was, does, is, is uh, trending better than 21, but it's still, it, it's still too high. We are, our, our strategy is following the White House strategy with uh, sort of building connections and detecting risk. We're getting, we're working harder on informing family members, making sure the family members can see and identify the risks, as well as continuing the separation of the individual in, at risk from the devices by which him or her might do death by suicide. So those are some of the, the projects we're, we're, we're moving forward on, but I owe you the exact numbers. Thank you. General Thompson. Ma'am, same. And we don't have the same challenges as the other services in that regard, but we know that that's as much a blessing. And we actually are putting in place resilience teams that look after health, wellness, emotional, physical, spiritual as Thank well you. To, to combat. General Martin, how many in the Army in total? 141, that's 25% less than last year at this time for the Army, and it's 14% below the five-year average, and it's 10% below the 10-year average, and it's just north of the 2019 rate per 100,000 for the civilian population of this country. If you believe that we're on an upward trajectory, the Army could potentially be below that average for the, for the country, we won't know because the CDC doesn't re release that data till a year or two after uh, they've compiled it and assessed it. Okay, um, I, I know my time's expired. Let me just say um, to uh, Admiral Kreitz um, and General Smith, um, you are lagging behind the other services in providing childcare. Overall, there's 19,000 families waiting for childcare. Um, the worst numbers appear to be um, in the Navy and um, the Marines. I visited uh, Pendleton just a few weeks ago. Um, we've, we've got to do a better job. That's part of retention. That's part of recruitment. And we've got to recognize that. If they can't access childcare, they're leaving. And I can't tell you the number of service member families I talked to when I was at Pendleton that had just, that said just that. So um, I'll just leave you with that and hopefully we can have a further discussion on that. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Ms. Spear. Uh, votes are called, so we're going to uh, terminate the hearing here in just a moment. Uh, I want to thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. Uh, there are a myriad of issues. All of them come together to create a force that is ready or not. And so what we need to do is to be informed 
on the multiple readiness issues, uh, child care retention issues, uh, all of those. Uh, I'm going to put forth a series of questions to you uh, that I would like you to deliver answers to us, some of them in writing, others in briefings, which I'll make available, which uh, all of the House Armed Services Committee members will be able to attend. We've got a lot of work to do on spare parts. We didn't even get to that. Did I talk about depots? No, I don't think so, not yet. Um, it goes on and on. I thank you for your attention today. Uh, we'll look forward to continuing on. Uh, with that, we are adjourned.